Hello. This is Nancy Kraft, and I'm talking today about continuity of operations after a disaster. So what do you do when you're confronted with this? How will you continue to operate? With the continuity of operation, or COOP plan, of course. And what is COOP? It's they, their guidelines or a plan that ensure that an institution can carry on all essential functions in case of a natural or man-made disaster. It addresses the planning, addresses the recovery of critical operations in the event of an incident or emergency. And it can be on short term or more extended. It can be during uh, it can be in terms of uh, tornadoes, hurricanes, floods. And you can be impacted for several days, weeks, or even longer. So we need to think about how to um, address these issues after we've responded to the initial disaster. Um, and it's, there, although it will, COOP planning follows many of the same steps as disaster emergency preparedness. What we focus on is on continuing operations rather than sa uh, salvage and stabilizing of collections and buildings. And these planning efforts can be either done in parallel or um, usually we get our disaster plans in place and then go to, to discussing about how to continue your operations. To continue your operations, what your goals are to ensure the continuity of your essential functions. Again, if you're familiar with your collection, uh, with your, excuse me, emergency planning, uh, you talk about what are your most important collections. This is not any different except that you're focusing what are your essential functions. And you want to reduce the adverse effects of disruption and want to re you need to figure out what you need to recover and restore in order to continue your business. And you need to just also develop strategies for keeping addressing your users' needs. Your plan should include what are your essential functions. And you should think about your personnel, who, who for what and how, your succession planning and authority, um, so that you have continuity of your planning and continuity of who's in charge. You need to think about your resources. What facilities do you need? Uh, where could they be if yours aren't available? Uh, how interoperable are your communications? Can you operate uh, off-site? Where are your essential records and databases? And uh, are you adequately prepared? planning considerations that you need to think about is, again, you're going to see parallels for any other uh, plans that you've put into place. Your team should be small. You need to think about your essential functions. Uh, and you need to think about them, not just the, your functions, but in relationship to how do these functions pr perform, what staff, resources, alternate facilities, equipment and authority do you need in order to keep these going? And, you need, and how are these fitting in with your emergency planning, your policies, your IT, communications, logis logistics, and do you have any legal uh, issues you need to think about? And what will be most critical, your most critical decisions in emergency? And also think about your implications as you're putting this plan together. What personnel choices are you going to make? And how are you going to deal with personnel who are told that their areas aren't essential? And you'll, you will probably be put in a position of either assuming unwelcome commitments and obligations or delegating them and probably uh, with these new obligations and responsibilities will become will uh, come cross-training and knowledge transfer. So you need to think about these things as you're putting your plan into place. Um, and 
I don't know about you, but whenever I start to do a plan, if if I'm thinking about the beginning to the end and how to get the pieces in place, I can become easily overwhelmed. So my recommendation is that you focus on the big questions first. Think about what's what's mission essential, what's most essential, and what records um, are are critical. And this I'm not just talking paper, but electronic. And are there right redundancies set up? And where are they? And think of this in a, in relationship to risk reduction. Um, how can I reduce the risk to these uh, essential records and functions ahead of time? And then fill in your plans as you and um, as you go along and 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 tweak them. And also as your plans mature. Uh, post them on the intranet so it's easy to keep up with what is most what is current. Your essential functions I've mentioned this several times, and it it just as with uh, de determining what collections are most important, you know, narrowing down exactly what's the highest priority of his, of functions can be difficult difficult especially when certain areas are suddenly not considered essential, this can cause some conflicts. So it's important to get this figured out ahead of time. And establishing a list of priorities um, and thinking about the functions and activities that must be continued under any and all circumstances. If you can focus on that, that should help you narrow down what's most important. And then to think about establishing your staffing and resources that are required to support these functions. So st start with this very core uh, item first. And, th and if, if that's hard, add urgent to it to help you further de define and focus on what's absolutely must perform without disruption. And if it's disrupted, is it unacceptable damage? And then, of course, are there any legal requirements? And then also consider your customer needs. And you're probably not working in isolation, so you need to also think about your relationship to your parent organization's essential functions. You will probably be tied in somewhere to a bigger picture. Think about your essential, your essential records. Be pre-positioned. Update on a regular basis and make sure that you've got duplicate records, databases, that back up uh, electronic media, and stored off-site. Have, have redundancy, be able to get to these things um, on, under a variety of different circumstances. So I've, I know I've said this before, but it doesn't hurt to reiterate that an organization must decide which records are vital or essential, and assign responsibility for their protection, storage, and upkeep to the appropriate staff. Uh, you need to do this to reduce your vulnerability, determine which records, files, and materials are most important in both your primary and alternate facilities, and consider their, your, their vulnerability to damage during different types of disasters and take steps to pr to protect them. So you really need to be just with any planning thinking thinking about different scenarios. And you need to consider multiple redundant media and in a variety of, of formats. Uh, uh, maintain a complete inventory of records with a copy of this inventory maintained at an alternate site. And I've, as I said before, identify physical risks at the current locations, not just a disaster, but as we do with disaster recovery planning, make sure that it uh, check out the, the structure, the surroundings, and uh, think about the different kinds of risks that could happen. And uh, in a, when you are looking, and also identify off storage not just the site, but but define what the requirements are so that if you have to go to an on-site, off-site place that uh, you know what kinds of uh, security things that you need to take put in place.
escape list of records recovery vendors and experts. Again, once you've identified what it is you need to protect, this will help you to identify what vendors you need. And again, uh, predetermine the roles and responsibilities of staff. Um, if you have implementation, um, this can be difficult to know when to implement your plan. So you really need to, to uh, know when and have a plan for activating and relocating. And as I've said before, find alternate facility operations. And this might seem like an easy thing to do, uh, but returning to normal operation from experience, I can tell you, is also needs plan and can be a challenge. So talking about activation and relocation, again, you need to have a decision process in place. You need to know who's going to make, determine who's going to make the decision to implement and, and how that's going to be done. How are the alerts and notifications going to be handled? Who's going to be in charge of this? And you, you pro, depending on your organization, you may want to be more than too deep because you want to make sure that the people that need to implement the plans are there. So your delegation of authority, is, it's very critical to have that decided ahead of time. Your alternate facility. Again, you need to think about what, what it is that you need to uh, perform, what systems you need in place, and, and, act, and activities. Is it uh, just computers, or do you need people to run them? Uh, what kind of tasks, daily tasks do you need to continue to uh, answer reference questions? Think about what it is that you need to do. Um, and I would think about scenarios of in between uh, session, if you're a, a school, in between sessions and, and also high season of uh, maybe think about what if this happened during uh, semester tests. So think about the different scenarios. And then determine the method of transferring and replicating these operations at an alternate site. Identify your files, your records, and your databases that you'll need, and determine what you need immediately and what you'll need in order to get back to normal operation. Your alternate facilities considerations are that you need to make sure you have sufficient space and equipment, a capability to perform essential functions, ideally within 12 hours, you will probably rate these as one, two, three, four. So um, you rank which ones come up first. But you also want to be thinking that you may need to be working off-site up to 30 days. This may be longer, but uh, after 30 days, you'll probably you, that 30 days will give you time to put more uh, permanent plans into place. You want. A reliable logistical support, how are you going to get there, how are you going to keep things up, what services are there, and do you have your infrastructures in place to maintain these? Again, thinking uh, up to 30 days. You need to consider uh, health, safety, and emotional well-being of your personnel. Again, if it's, things need to be interoperable, and what kind of computer and software do you need? Now, returning to normal operations may take months or years. Hopefully, you, the situations you'll deal with will, will be less than this. But you need to be aware that returning to normal operations could be a lengthy process. And if it is lengthy, you need to think about taking a phased approach. And you may have to deal with securing different facilities. So this is kind of a background. I thought that I would go through uh, how we handled this at several different institutions that in 2008 that might give you some ideas of scenarios uh, that you could be looking at as you're putting your plan in place. So University of Iowa Libraries has the Iowa River going through it. It splits 
it splits our buildings into east and west side of the river. Our river came up slow, so we had a lot of time to to implement our plan. Uh, and the the west bank tends to is lower, so at first we thought we were only going to be dealing with west bank, and we evacuated staff from art and music over to the main library. And we used our website and listservs to keep staff and public posted. Uh, and it wasn't just the libraries that were being located, relocated. It was staff from all those buildings. So our director was working with, a, with a other officials to, to figure out where everyone could be placed and opening up uh, study rooms and things like that to try to accommodate everybody. Friday the 13th, aptly named, we, uh, we had one day to uh, move our collections and to close down the main library. We, up until Friday, didn't really think that the waters were going to get to our building. So we had one day to evacuate. We needed to move as many collections from the library basement, evacuate our hundred uh, staff. We had about six hours to do that. We needed to move our servers and lock down the main library and we served the public until the building was closed. So here are just some scenes. You've probably have seen these uh, on news stories and things of evacuating our collections. And um, again, we're thinking always ahead as for when we are opening opening our doors, so everything was, our books and everything were kept somewhat in um, call number order, much much to the chagrin of our volunteers who thought they could move things quicker if we would just stack things up all over the place. But we were always thinking of ahead to when we would be back in the building. So by nine o'clock, we had moved by hand fifty thousand of our half million books. And uh, all of our manuscripts up to five feet, our 16 millimeter film, films, again, our staff. And we were sent home for a week with pay and only staff critical to the uh, operation of the university and to stabilizing the university were allowed uh, to stay, to come back to work. So we were essentially told, that we weren't we weren't needed in person on on campus and told to to go home and encouraged to uh, help others. We had forty buildings that were flooded, including the main library that took a little bit of water and buildings that, as I mentioned before, art and music. And as we came back after the week, we were relocated to several other libraries. Luckily, we had other branch libraries. The plan was put into place uh, through, tele uh, through telephone conference and emails, and we were all given our assignments before we came back on campus. We negotiated with the campus uh, uh, with, with the campus personnel to be allowed access to the main library twice a day so that we could pull and reshelf books and continue to provide service to our uh, customers. And we kept the public and staff informed via listservs and postings and, um, and radio and, and, other, and other mechanisms. And the library director and facilities manager met twice daily with the UI recovery team. And they did this for, for uh, several months. And here's just some scenes to show you. Um, this is the art library. And with the, uh, we also got permission. The art library, let me back up. The uh, main library was down, I believe, about three weeks. Uh, and so we provided service by going, like I said, twice a day through security points, checkpoints, to bring in and reshelve. The art library was down and music for several months. In fact, they're still down. And for several months, we provided service 
uh, in, in these buildings by no elevators. So you can see we had hand trucks and we used, this is an important piece of gear, we used head, head uh, lights <laughs> and uh, because even though the picture shows that it's light, it was really, it's a, a digital photo so it makes it all look light and bright, but it's dark and this is how, and hot, and this is how we served our, our public for several months. In, in January, we determined that the music library collection would have to be moved to the main library, which is 100,000 volumes. And we determined that it was going to take a long time, probably years, before the music library would be in a functional a building. And in July, we determined the same thing with the art library, another 100,000 came over. So we had very little seating for, for students. In fact, the campus had very little seating. If you remember, I told you we had several buildings down. This became very uh, critical to provide student um, seating and study areas. So we worked with FEMA and d determined that we could get a temporary storage building. And in August, we pulled 200,000 volumes out of the main library into temporary storage uh, to, in order to free up much needed uh, seating and, and study area for our students. So, um, and we did this 200,000 move in six weeks. We were told in July that if we could get uh, our storage and and volumes moved in six weeks that we could have the storage. So in six weeks we found storage, we um, put in, installed shelving and moved the books over. Now that means that there was no time to track what books were moved over. And today we're celebrating the fact that we now know what books were put over and everyone else does too because it's now entered in our online catalog. So we had to be very flexible to keep our, keep our operations going and uh, we had to do things backwards. This isn't the way that we like to do things, but in order to accommodate essential needs, we did things, like I say, backwards and put things over and then uh, logged them in. Um, we had the university, thank goodness, had a coop, they, uh, and it's embedded in our disaster response plan. It's in Appendix A, and this gives you some the bullets of the things that they covered. Uh, you can see that they talked about relocation and records protection and loss reporting guidelines. Uh, we spent um, not just the records, documenting records, but uh, the university had teams of photographers go out and document uh, uh, all the buildings, including students, the dorms, uh, taking photos of all the items that were, were destroyed, which was very grueling work, but all of it was documented. Uh, it includes the phone numbers, and, and we communicate, our authority is the Board of Regents, so we that's included in delegation of authority and plan review and, and maintenance. So it looks similar to a disaster response plan. Um, for, it's very important that you stay connected. And we divided our services into kind of four uh, levels. The first is critical for the university. So again, looking to our larger institution, we determined what needed to be back up the same day. And then we looked at what's critical for the libraries and established that it needed to be set backed up, back up within 24 hours. So as you're looking at your services and what should come up when, you also should have a, a guideline for how soon things should be up. And then we put down essential uh, and and other. So we had four categories. And I, I found this email the other day as I was preparing for this, and I just loved this quote. I'd forgotten about it. 
The word of the day is fluid, as in the situation is fluid. Remember, we're talking about a flood. Any information in this message might have changed by the time you read it. Or if it weren't for all this fluid, we would not have had to evacuate art music in Maine. So we really need to, to not just keep everyone informed, but occasionally use a little bit of uh, humor. So um, critical for University of Iowa, as I just a couple slides ago, was down for four hours. And it would have been shorter, but telecommunications pulled the switch on the basement on Friday morning. And that wasn't a part of our plan. So that's something that we will tweak, because our, some of our communication is in, um, in our basement. So we need to think about that. So. Um, Online service is critical to the university. Now, according to our, as I said, according to our response plan, these four services should be restored first. I thought this might be helpful if you could see the kinds of the way what we prioritize this first, second, and third. So the first one is our card catalog, and, and these are all uh, basic. Um, where our basic information uh, online services, sorry. <laughs> um, and then critical to the library, these were done within 24 hours. And this is our, our um, email, our intranet for co communication, and then our, our two drives that we use for our documents. And then within a week, we had these other services, which are blogs, wikis, uh, and our online uh, content DM, and, and that type of uh, access. And within the first week, these are things that hadn't been restored but did come up within the next week or so. So you see our tests and smart searches and some of our other things, uh, the CD server. And, and things like that. So hopefully this will give you some idea of, of how to think about uh, the other. I think maybe this will help you think about how to organize at, at your end. We also, I think I mentioned in the email from Paul Soderdahl that we were keeping staff informed. And by we, I mean, um, not only was the director and IT keeping us informed, but as supervisors, we were checking in with staff continually. So up and down the line, we were keeping very informed, everyone informed. Uh, we used uh, one of the things that uh, a piece of instruction that went out that you may find of interest is uh, information on how to use our phones. Uh, forwarding calls and checking voicemail, making sure that uh, we stayed connected, not to forget that our phones were sitting back at our desks and people might be calling us, and how to use web-based, since we some of us weren't necessarily used, used to going through the web rather than to our desktops, and uh, helping us relocate, explaining rules if we were suddenly using remote desktop and we hadn't been, been before. And uh, websites, editing, that was uh, not considered an essential. And so that we kept that very limited. And then we were kept in, up informed, as we are every day, on servers and, and services status. And so now I'd like to talk to um, uh, the Cedar, about the Cedar Rapids. So I work in Iowa City. And I live in Cedar Rapids. And so when we were told to go for home for a week, um, I chose to assist with the, with the Cedar Rapids flood. And I'll go through these different scenarios. The, the libraries and museums on the east and west 
the libraries and museums on the east and west side of the, the river. Again, our city is, spl is split, as most cedar, as many river cities are. And our, unfortunately, the predictions for Cedar Rapids were based on a broken river gauge. Now, the National Czech and Slovak Museum and Library were on the lower bank, as you can see a parallel here, as with museum, uh, music and art. And um, so they had uh, two and a half days to evacuate. And they, they did get a lot of things out, but unfortunately, they were told but they weren't going to get a whole lot of water. So um, they, they may have approached things a little bit differently. Cedar Rapids Public Library had a five and a half hour notice. They were pretty high up on the other higher bank. An African American Museum had none. They were not expecting to have any waters. So African American Museum were Fortunately, several came in to work early, uh, just before the man mandatory evacuation. So they had about 20 minutes to, to evacuate. So what the collections manager did was copy all her files to the network server on the second floor before leaving. And she didn't necessarily do that on a regular basis. And then she took a lot of files, uh, paper and electronic home, to uh, work on an exhibit that was upcoming. And as she was going home, she used her cell phone, and she had a temporary office space within 10 minutes of leaving the, the museum, which I think is just amazing. She, to do this, and she didn't have a coop, so, but to do this, she used a long-term relationship with Masonic Library. They get, had set them up immediately with uh, access to computer and office space. And by a Friday, they had the entire staff in a large conference room with phones and computers. They had a secured storage space for dry collections. The only thing they had to do, the, the Mason stipulated that they were giving all services at no charge. They were lucky that all their business records, their server and the mechanicals were on the second floor, and the floods didn't reach that high, uh, and not all staff copied their files to the server. So they lost several uh, weeks of worth of work. So this is a simple thing that could be put into place. And the other thing that they did in order to stay in business, as soon as the doors were pried open, uh, they sent uh, one of their, they didn't have a big staff, but they sent one of their, they sent Ben off to identify funding sources, write grants, and fill out all paperwork for local, state, and federal funding. So they immediately assigned someone to uh, seek out financial funds. And here's just a, we have to include this gloomy piece here. And this is just some scenes of what they were dealing with. You can see the flood line was about five feet. So they didn't have a coop. They did have insurance. This is something you need to think about whether you do a coop or not. But um, they had insurance on borrowed uh, items for exhibits. But they unfortunately had canceled their flood insurance because the building was paid for. They had training on disaster preparedness and response, which is good. And they also had their entire collection in past perfect. Uh, which included photos of their objects. So they had an excellent uh, database, and, and the database was on the second floor. So they had their uh, collections in their collections. They had an inventory, and um, the flood was in June, and in January they had a grand reopening. And the entire time that they were out of their building, they had they kept their um, they had public programming already scheduled for around the state, and they kept all their public programming going. And uh, obviously, they continued to work on their exhibit. So they were they were very focused on on staying a, a vital organization and, and keep maintaining their operations from the minute they left the well, even before they left the building. Um, the Cedar Rapids Public Library were told. Let's see, am I missing? Okay. 
sorry about this. Um, although the nonprofits were able to get quickly into their buildings, unfortunately, the Cedar Rapids, uh, the city of Cedar Rapids, would not let staff or volunteer conservators into their buildings. So um, the public library was told at 11:30 that they had to be out by five. They had no help. But by now, uh, volunteer assistance of any kind was was very stretched. So they divided up into four teams. They did sandbagging, moved items to higher shelves. The special collection was the second floor, and they secured the electrical equipment. The servers on the second floor served libraries in three cities. The power went out. So there was no online service to anyone for uh, several weeks. They set up storefronts within three days in the mall. And they had already had a presence there in a branch library. But they were able to secure other, other spaces. FEMA did not consider libraries, does not consider libraries critical. This is something you need to be aware of. And um, so that the funding for library, they, uh, so they had to have, uh, they had difficulty getting any kind of FEMA funding. Although in the end they did get some, but not right up front. So even though they didn't consider them critical, they um, sent people to the library to do their paperwork. And the library had only two computers. Uh, I was told that the lines to use these uh, got a little bit ugly. But what they did is they networked with libraries in the area and they posted lists of free internet access so that they did help people get to other, other computers within the area. Now, when you're out of a building, how do you keep your staff? employed. They, um, they had to retrofit several of their, spa their current space, but they also secured other spaces. So they used their staff to, to convert the store, the mall stores, into a small library. And it, it kept staff employed, and it helped them feel useful and, and occupied. Um, they, unfortunately, they did have to do a, a couple layoffs. So they had only several, they had storefronts, there are several of them all downtown, uh, but most of the collection is in storage and it still is after two years, although they have managed to get a, a temporary fill, a facility downtown and bring out more items. They lost over 100 computers. They didn't have a coop plan. They did have some disaster response planning, and they've now are contracted with their online catalog vendor for backup service so that if their service goes down, they are still online. And if this is something that uh, those in the audience don't have, this is something I would highly recommend that you figure out how to keep your online catalog up and going. And they did not have a designated PR person but which turned out to be a critical piece. So the National Czech and Slovak Museum and Library, they, as I said before, they had two and a half days to evacuate. They had their more vulnerable collections up or out. Their servers were on second floor level, so they were OK there. But they were told to expect two inches to two feet, and they acted accordingly, and they got seven to eight feet. They immediately uh, began looking for alternate space, and their membership assisted in locating an office and collection storage space. And they were up within a few days. So here's this a scene of the library, again, to give you an idea of the kinds of things that you could face. Uh, so you, to remember, you are trying to stay open and vital at the same time as you're salvaging out. And this can be rather tricky. Um, they've had to move their collections a couple times. They established a presence in the mall. They had an exhibit, the store, and meeting and program space. That was set up by fall. They had offices, as I said, up within a couple days. 
and they did put up an exhibit in the Cedar Rapids Art Museum, and I should say that the University of Iowa Art Museum has uh, their collections up in uh, another museum in in Davenport, and also in our in our student union. So there's we're using lots of different ways to stay visible. Uh, to, as a side note, our Cedar Rapids Symphony promptly renamed themselves the Symphony of Iowa and now go all over the state. So uh, we've managed, in a lot of ways, to become even more visible and more vital. They, uh, the Czech Village is back in a, they're back in a small building they, in, in this April. So it took two years to get back down into, into the Czech Village. And they have all their offices there and, and uh, a small exhibit. The new museum is at least two to three years off. The board was very effective. It helped uh, get them back up and going. They did have good PR advocacy and funding. They stayed visible. They used their website to stay relevant. Uh, and their message was that they are relevant in a place of action that they're still up and running and, the, and where are the new places to visit. They had a coop light. And the, their disaster plan had a statement that said that they were to work with other entities to collate, collect, co-locate collections. And that's exactly what they did. They had training. And they were happy with their disaster response company, but they're going to have a, a letter plan to have some letters of, it, of uh, intent. So that's a piece that they're going to uh, improve upon. So some observations from all these different uh, examples is that uh, it's, it's important to have an up-to-date disaster plan. Uh, having a cont continuity of operation without a disaster plan doesn't, I don't think, quite work. You need to have both. And uh, the coop can be uh, embedded as the, the uh, University of Iowa, or it can be a separate plan. You need to be, keep your files backed up regularly. And I say this as a, as a staff person and as a, an organization. You need to have your servers off-site and lots of redundancies. You need to use your networks to find space, supplies, and whatever. Uh, and make sure that your governing entity uh, that you've educated and negotiated your governing en entity ahead of time uh, establish working late. This is one <laughs> that the African American Museum asked me to put in. They said make sure that they know that they should have a working relationship with their local conservation lab that's uh, helpful in getting your collections back in, in use. And you definitely need to have a PR person and just be aware that your business, is, it is business, but it's unusual plus, and it may be for many years. Uh, and you need to think outside the box, and you need to communicate regularly with staff and public. And I can tell you, we're two years out, and we're still shifting and changing. And I don't know how long that's going to go. I've, I've heard that usually in a, a disaster the size that we had, you can expect up to 10 years. And then, of course, so much changes that you've forgotten what usual was. Here are resources that I would like, that I'm recommending. Um, there is, this first one is the template that's put out by FEMA. It's excellent. And then, if you want more training, you want to go beyond this webinar, the, the site at Heritage Preservation has some good uh, training sites there. And here's our, again, I've posted here, our COOP, which feel free to use. And then I'm making an effort to try to tr uh, document our recovery in our, in our blog. I'm a little behind, and I just yesterday, uh, this week, um, dealt with a, a flood at Colfax, a small museum there. And we'll be getting that up pretty soon. But um, so we're, we're getting a, lots of rain. And so we're lucky. We've only had two or three 
uh, institutions that have the collections that have been impacted. Unfortunately, a lot of personal homes have been. Here are some additional resources. There are a couple uh, videos. They're short that uh, document the flood. The first one is documenting the flood of downtown Cedar Rapids. The second one is the university. And then again, I'm repeating. This one is the, the university critical incident management plan. And of course, all the useful resources at uh, Heritage Preservation. And I'd like to point out to recognize that some of the information that I used are based on presentations that were given at the Society of American Archivists uh, conference August 13, 2009. Uh, they were very useful in assisting with defining uh, COOP. And um, I encourage all of you to do one thing this month. Uh, make a list of essential functions or establish a COOP committee. And uh, before we I allowed a little bit of time for questions, so this would be the time to answer questions before I turn it back over to uh, Stephanie. So if there's any questions, let's see if I can get my box bigger. So um, there, the, we have a I have a question here about if if you can't finish the webinar, is there a way to listen to this session later? And yes, you will be getting a a, um, a link to this uh, webinar. And since you'll be able to get a um, a link to this uh, slideshow, I would encourage you to rebroadcast it, to show it at your computer. This is certainly something that we want to get out to everyone. So are there any other questions or comments? We'll give you a couple minutes. I uh, just at sessions on thinking about longer than COOP, thinking about the 10 years, which is what we're into, and it, it kind of gets overwhelming. So I, I encourage you to think, think one step at a time and not get overwhelmed. OK. Let's see. Does FEMA consider state archives or any other activity important? The, um, you really need to connect with FEMA ahead of time to find out what they consider important and not. It gets kind of tricky. But they do consider state archives imp important in that they have recognized that um, that they have essential records. So they'll at least consider the essential records as, as something critical to save. They also will consider buildings essential. And so sometimes, in fact, that's what we were working with yesterday. We had a, a building and collections at, at risk. And we, we don't know if this strategy will work, but we're looking at uh, working with FEMA on the building piece and uh, other funds for collections, but uh, you certainly need to identify what's most important and have those uh, organized I into one, two, three, so you've got them categorized. But FEMA f considers them important in that they've put on several sessions, and at their site, I believe there's some training on identifying vi vital records. I have another question about did we make arrangements to save our card catalog? Our catalogs are all online, and we have um, our material is we can get that over uh, on servers that are not on our site. So uh, that's how we've arranged. We can get once we can get reconnected, we can serve our catalog up at any time. I used to work at an institution that had card catalogs in the card. And what we did there is we sent our 
uh, cards out to be microfilmed. So if you're still working from card catalog, I would recommend that you get your shelf list um, microfilmed. And someone has asked how many student staff at the university. I don't have those figures at my fingertip. I believe we've got close to 30,000 uh, students. And I'm hesitant to guess at the staff. And the, the subtext question of this from this person is, how does the number affect planning? And I'm, I've worked with really small institutions up to the university. And I, you know, it's all the same issues. And you're all, no matter what size the institution, you don't ever have quite enough staff. The smaller the institution, I believe you've got to be a little more creative in pulling in people to assist you. And you may need to be going to uh, board members, uh, volunteers to assist you. Uh, and you, you may want to bring in somebody to assist you with the planning. But um, I don't know that, um, like I say, the more staff and people you have, the more staff you have to assist. So I'm not sure that, that numbers affect planning. It's a matter of scale. And someone has asked, does COOP address how employees are expected to balance the recovery at work and home? It, it sort of does, and it, it addresses that you need to be thinking about um, the, the mental well-being of your personnel. And this is something that I encourage you to, to draft in your own document and think about, uh, do you have uh, on campus or on, uh, within your institution, do you have counseling uh, available? It's, in 2008, uh, state of Iowa made counseling available to assist people in helping with the balance. But I'd really recommend that in this section, that when you start dealing with staff and reassignments, that you think about uh, uh, making some counseling uh, available or mentoring uh, some kind of support system to help people not only balance their work and their home, but possibly uh, dealing with reassignments and relocation. So are there any other questions? I think we've got two, three minutes. So I, and I hope I haven't missed any. Let's see. Well, I'll give you another minute. I know it takes a while to type. Um, you have my email. If you've got any questions after this that you uh, think of, uh, if you happen to go to my to our blog and you'd like any of the um, entries elaborated or ex further explained, uh, feel free to answer to ask in the comment section because we choose whether that's displayed to the public. So um, um, I can answer. I could choose to either answer on or offline. So I think if there are no more questions, OK, let's see. I think I've just got one. OK. The question is, who is included in your COOP? Library, library, and university, library, university, and city. Um, it's, it's the university and then all the different departments, which includes the, the library. But they also address how to, how to work externally but in, in um, keeping vital. But I would encourage you to look at that because it will go in more, in more detail. But it is primarily focused on uh, what is essential and critical and, and how to keep those, those going. So it would only relate in what entities we need to keep us going. 
but it does get down to the department level, which the library is. So, um, I think with that, I will do my best to turn this back over to Stephanie. So let's see if I can do that. Thank you, Nancy, for a very informative presentation. I think we can all learn a lot from your experiences to better prepare for disasters in our own institutions. Thank you to our sponsor for the Disaster Preparedness Series, the HF Group, and thanks as well to Wade Wyckoff, a member of the LEX Continuing Education Committee, for his technical assistance. Later this afternoon or tomorrow, you will receive a short online evaluation form. Please take a few minutes to fill it out and return it to us. The comments we receive help the LEX Continuing Education Committee to plan and shape future continuing education offerings, not only on the topic of preservation, but also on other subjects. The next SELECTS webinar will be Introduction to RDA on September 22nd. Thank you all for your attention today. I hope you will join us again for future ELECTS webinars.